very good evening everybody my name is sonakshi verma and i along with rohel amin the senior editor of exchange for media welcome you all to the day 2 of martech india bridge 1 scheduled from 23 to 26 of june a virtual event that will uncover insights about how marketers in the real world will have to rethink what technology is really need which which ones will really help them save money and which ones can trans transform the businesses that have been altered in the current crisis Uh, the event is a precursor to Martech India 2020, which is tentative, tentatively scheduled on 24th of September, and slated to be the biggest Martech event in India we have ever seen. It is also the next step towards building a robust marketing community in India. Today's sessions focus on marketing technologies for the new world. Our thought leaders for the day are Jim Stern. He is the founder of Marketing Analytics Summit and has written a book called Artificial Intelligence for Marketing Practical Applications. Then we have Varit Saurav. He is the Vice President, Product Management and Marketing Technology, Manthan. Uh, along with him, we have Kashyap uh, Kampela. He is the CEO, RPA Two AI, and also the co-author of Practical Artificial Intelligence. Then Prasad Ayer. He is the Vice President, Digital E-Commerce Distribution and Rewards at Lemon Tree Hotels. And then we have Alan Fels Shah. He is the founder of Deep Analysis and the co-author of Practical Artificial Intelligence. Um, if you have any questions for uh, from the audience, you can put them down on the Zoom chat, or you can also use the hashtag Mark, uh, Martech India and post them on Twitter. We also have a comment section on our Facebook page where we are live currently, and as an Instagram too. Uh, now we begin the first session of the day with Jim's uh, Jim Stern. Uh, just a quick introduction about Jim. He is an internationally known speaker and a consultant to Fortune 500 companies, and an in, and an entrepreneur with over 25 years of experience in sales and marketing most of that on measuring the value of digital media for creating and strengthening customer relationships he is the author of dozen books and on ma marketing customer experience email marketing and web analytics so jim i welcome you on board and by the way it is 4:30 a.m. in santa barbara california so jim can see right jim having a, his uh, cup of coffee right now Yes. Thank you, Jim, for joining us. And over to you. And we will come back to you with questions at the end. Very good. Well, it is a, an honor, very much so, an honor to be here. I was excited to be able to join you live. I had hoped to join you in person, um, and I, I send you greetings from. Uh, well, what I usually say is sunny Southern California, but that's not going to be for another hour yet. So, <laughs> good morning from here. Um, so I've had that very nice introduction. Thank you. Um, I started a, um, a conference back in 2002, and the audience created the professional association, the Digital Analytics Association, um, in order to keep track of how well are we doing. And we've had more data, we have more sophisticated tools, and now the most sophisticated tool is artificial intelligence. I don't want to make it very clear that the what we imagine as artificial intelligence as we have been told in the movies is simply not the case um these these systems are not going to take on human form they're not going to uh, become sentient they're not going to take over your job so don't worry about that you will have a job and i will I can assure you by the end of this presentation you'll understand why and how but do focus on narrow ai or functional ai specific tasks that ai can perform are going to be very valuable this is the to do list so for those of you who um are just get give me the answers um there will not be a quiz so here are the answers number 1 what do you want to do in this whole ai realm what role do you want to play what tools are you going to use and understanding ai tools is crucial how are they different getting to know your data is essential because the data is so much more important now than it's ever been you can use artificial intelligence tools to augment yourself and become an augmented marketer branding becomes even more important and finally Well you know B2B and you know B2C now we're going to have M to M and you'll just have to wait to find out what that is so stick around I want to start with choosing your role I 
The last company I worked for, which is now 38 years ago, I had a terrible boss, could not stand this man. And I work, we worked very hard together trying to get along, not successfully. So I went to his boss and I said, I need anything else to do in this company. Love the company, love the product, want to participate, but can't stand the man. And the boss's boss said, well, what do you like to do? And I was shocked. I had, I had never been asked that before. It never occurred to me that my job could be something that I liked to do. You're paying me to do this. Why, why would it be something I enjoy? And I thought about it long enough and realized that I really enjoyed giving presentations and educating people. So here I am, 40 years later, doing exactly that. What is it that you love to do? What turns you on? What kind of, of activity excites you the most? That's the thing to focus on. That's where you can apply yourself, enjoy the work you're doing, and add value to the company. So what do you like? What do you enjoy? Do you like being in charge? Perhaps you're an entrepreneur. Perhaps you are a business manager making business decisions. But maybe you like the idea of taking business problems and translating them into data problems. That's where the analyst lives. Or you like building very complex predictive analytics models in order to try to simulate the real world in order to make predictions about what might happen. Or maybe you like building things. Maybe you like the idea of building a data pipeline and a platform that other people can use to build their models. Maybe you like to invent algorithms. Maybe you like to get deep into the math. That can be very exciting. Or maybe you just want to explore the new tools. You want to find out how artificial intelligence and machine learning works and dive deep into all of that. These are all available and they're all very much needed. Now, I myself enjoy the analyst role. So as you could have guessed from Digital Analytics Association, I like this idea of understanding the business and understanding the data and trying to make sense out of it with the help of the data scientists but you have to choose for yourself. Next comes the tools. Now you, you, you know the classic statement that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We have an enormous number of tools available to us. The MarTech stack is beyond comprehension, but Mar uh, machine learning and AI fit in a particular area. And I wanna explain this historically. You've learned programming, maybe C++, or, or in my case, uh, started with BASIC and then Fortran and COBOL. Yes, I am that old. Um, and it is just straight logic. You tell the machine exactly what to do and how to do it, and it performs marvelously. It, if this happens, it'll do that. If that happens, it'll do the other thing. If it doesn't understand, it gives you an error. And if you've really done a bad job, it's the blue screen of death. So that's just programming, straightforward. It's fragile. It requires a lot of attention from the human to make sure it's right. And then we move along to the mathematical model. Now this is where you take values and their relationships and formulas and you create a mathematical model of maybe your, your marketing budget or your household budget or what sales predictions might be. Yeah, I'm talking about an Excel spreadsheet. It is a different kind of software. You are programming the spreadsheet with formulas for yourself. Then we move on to predictive analytics. This is where we take the data that we have and build a model to try to reflect the real world so that it can assume what might happen next. It predicts. Also very fragile. Lots of assumptions built in, requires lots of statistical rigor. And then comes machine learning, and this is a completely different animal. This is where we have the computer look at the data, derive rules, and find structure in the data, make its own model from the data, and when new data comes in, it can change its mind. And that's why we call it artificial intelligence, because intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. Now, machine learning comes in three flavors. 
supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. And these are all valuable for marketing because they do slightly different things. Supervised is where you know the answer and you're teaching the machine with lots and lots of examples. Lots and lots of examples of, is this a picture of a cat? Give it 100,000 pictures of cats and then give it a random picture and it will say, yes, that's a cat or no, it's not. And you have to teach it over and over and over. Lots of really good labeled data. So that might be, these are the emails that we've received from people who become customers. When you see an email that looks like this, we can assume, we can predict that that person is going to become a customer because we've trained it to recognize what kind of emails come in. Unsupervised, oh, this is a lot of fun. Unsupervised is where you give the machine lots of information and you ask it to tell you something that you didn't know. You say, do you see a pattern? Do you see something unusual? Can you draw my attention to some part of this data that I'm not thinking about? And then reinforcement, and this is probably the most practical version, where you give the machine a goal and, and you give it agency. You give it the ability to impact the environment. Uh, the goal is I want more people to open my email. So I give it control over the subject line and it sends out tens of thousands of emails with different subject lines and sees which one cause more emails to be opened. It's learning. That is reinforcement. We give it a goal and we hope that it figures it out for us. Supervised, you know the answer in your teaching machine. Unsupervised, it's telling you things you didn't know. Reinforcement, you give it a task and a goal and turn it loose. So why is machine learning so powerful then? What can it do better than humans? It's great at finding correlations. It's, it's amazing at, at finding obvious things. Um, when the weather is bad, people buy more things online. Well, yes, that's true, but I knew that. So tell me something I didn't know. Well, people who open this email and look at that page and have used that search term are 75% more likely to be customers within 30 days. Oh, now that's useful, that I can use. And segmentation, we have different kinds of customers. And clustering, here's how different behaviors look in the, in the real world and how we might address them as separate segments. And then finally, there's outliers. Here's where, here's what, here's something we did not know at all. This is, this is a very strange anomaly. Perhaps, perhaps there's a problem with the data, but maybe that's a business opportunity. So the machines are really good at elevating things for you to look at, but it's for you to decide, is it interesting? Is it useful? Can I use it to help my business? If I am ranking, if I am sorting, looking for patterns. These are the things that machine learning can do better than other programming and certainly better than humans. In marketing, that means machine learning is very good at A-B testing, for example, or lead scoring. Which leads should the marketing department send on to the sales department? Even meeting scheduling now. There's, there's a tool that will uh, if we want to get together for lunch, I'll send you an email and I'll copy this AI system and you and the AI system trade emails about when I might be available until there's an appointment set and it gets added to my calendar. Content personalization. I show up at your website. You have seen me a couple of times before. You've seen some of the interchanges through email. Oh, you know what I'm interested in and you can automatically surface the content that might be most interesting to me, et cetera, et cetera. So these ranking and sorting and clustering activities, finding um, correlations, that's what the machine's really good at. And you should use it if you have lots and lots and lots of data, well-labeled. So advertising, for instance, it is a huge amount of data because you're doing perhaps millions of ads. It is Small consequence. If you put the wrong ad in front of the wrong person, it's not, it's not like a self-driving car. <laughs> that's a big consequence. But if you put the wrong ad in front of the wrong person, that's okay. It's not, it doesn't cost that much. But the machine learns how to put the right ad in front of the next person. You have good data. It's well-labeled. 
And it's not just, it's not the tool for everything. There is a cost to it. So don't just use machine learning because it's there. Use it if you have to. If an Excel spreadsheet can do the job, use an Excel spreadsheet by all means. Then there's the question of what language do I use? And the running joke is if it's written in R, it's probably statistical analysis. If it's written in Python, it's probably machine learning, but you know it is artificial intelligence if it's written in PowerPoint. So you have to decide which language you want to learn, but do learn one of them. And by all means, if you're just a straight marketing person, please at least spend an hour reading Wikipedia about what SQL is all about, just so you know your way around data. But do think about solving new problems because this is a new capability. Now, the data becomes so important because we're trusting the machine to find the rules and find the structure and create its own model. So you have to be really confident in your data and there's lots of ways that data can go wrong. Now, as a marketing person, I, I want to trust my data engineers, but I have to know something about it. Just like as a manufacturer of soup, I have to trust the person responsible for the celery and the person responsible for the salt and the person responsible for the chicken. Because if the soup makes somebody sick, I have to go back and find out which one of those was the problem. Same with data. I need a data steward for each data stream. Because I'm going to bet my job on this. I'm going to say, I think this is the right answer. This is the recommendation the machine made. And I trust the data. Therefore, I trust the recommendation. Over and over, the top two success criteria are doing the work to build a data infrastructure and a willingness to learn from failure. The first is tactical, the second is cultural, neither is optional. You have to be confident in your data and you have to be willing to let the machine try things that don't work out the right way. I mean, learning from failure is actually the definition of machine learning. It tries stuff and it learns. All right, let's get personal you need to be an augmented marketer. That means instead of just a T-shaped professional where you're really good at marketing, but you know something about all the rest of these, you also know a lot about your industry and you understand analytics really well. It's becoming harder to be a professional in any industry and marketing, yeah, we're just layering on more stuff, but we have tools that can help us individually. So I write books and I teach Microsoft Word about my language. These are the words I use. I add it to the dictionary. Or in my spreadsheet, I'm creating the ability to count or the ability to rank, or I write macros. And these are my ways of interpreting that data. I talked about the system that will set up meetings through email. That's x.ai. It's free. You can try that. You can use something I've used for 10 years, auto hotkey, to create my own keyboard shortcuts. I mean, how often a day do you type your email address? And I just use two keys and boom, it's done. So you can also use Google now, Gmail will fill in the rest of your sentence. It will guess what you're trying to say and fill in the sentence for you. Your job is to take all of these tools and make yourself an augmented marketer and put all of those on your LinkedIn profile and you become very interesting to prospective employers. And then we're gonna brand, oh boy, we need to brand because we've got these voice activated systems. If I ask Alexa, oops, shouldn't say that out loud because you probably, you might have one in your home. If I ask the Amazon Echo to send me batteries, I will get Amazon branded batteries and perhaps Samsung will send me Samsung branded batteries. So. The people at Duracell have to make sure that I ask for their product by name. So I have to brand. But then we get to machine to machine marketing. B2B, B2C, M to M. Marketing is gonna get a little strange. So I just want you to see over the horizon to see what's coming. Number one, customers own their own data and they store their own data. Right now that's not the case. 
Right now, I'm telling all of these apps and all of these websites my information. Here's my email address, here's and my password, and here's uh, my shipping address, and here are my preferences. I'm going to flip that around. I'm going to store my own information in a secure location, and I'm going to give these apps access. So if I do move to another apartment, I, ep- I enter that once, and all of those apps, when they need it, can be updated. And then... I'm going to run my own agent on top of that data. It is my agent. It's not Google, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, (laughs) GAFTA. And it knows everything about me. And I give access to the people and the websites and the apps that I want to. I give my accountant access to all of my financial data. And I give my doctor access to all of my medical data, but not vice versa. And I let this system work on my behalf because the ultimate convenience is having to do nothing, right? So today I subscribe to the filters for my air conditioner, the ink for my printer, the soap that my wife likes. It just shows up on my doorstep with, without me having to remember when it, come, when, in, when it shows up. Oh yeah, that's right. I needed that. I didn't know that. We used to shop and then ship and we're switching that around to ship and then shop. There's this company called Stitch Fix that started doing this years ago. They send you a box of clothes in your size, according to your style, you choose the ones you want and send back the rest. They ship, then you shop, then you send back the stuff you don't want. Finally, bonus number seven, you will always be needed. AI is not going to take your job. That's a myth. It is going to help you do your job, but you will always be needed for three things. Number one, what problem do you want to solve? What question do you want answered? What are you trying to accomplish? What is the business goal? You have to decide what you want the computer to do. You have to decide what data you want the computer to look at so that it can do machine learning, but you have to tell it what, to, what the training data is. And then finally, you have to evaluate the output. We can't always trust these machines because they don't have common sense. They don't have reason. They just have statistical analysis. And it might give you an answer that is statistically correct, but absolutely useless. I call this the smell test. And it's something that's incredibly obvious the minute you look at it. This I came across in a hospital recently. It's pretty obvious that that's not installed correctly. And any human being looks at that and goes, what on earth were they thinking? That's wrong. But you can understand how it happened. Same thing with artificial intelligence. Your job is to perform the smell test. Now, I like being between the analyst and the and the between the business stakeholder and the data. This is the part that's fun for me. Data science, data engineers, some people love that stuff. It's not me. I love doing the analysis, trying to figure out what the data means and make it purposeful and valuable. And if you wanna be an analyst, it turns out it's not always the person with the best technology. You just have to have good brains. It's not necessarily the person with the best algorithm. You can do it with a spreadsheet. It's not even necessarily the person with the best data or even the best vision of the future. The best analyst is the person who asks the best questions. You learn critical thinking and you learn how to ask good questions. And the one who asks the best questions wins. So that's what I wanted to cover today. I'm so happy I was able to join you and I'm delighted to take any questions if there are any. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you so much, Jim, for this wonderful conversation. A lot of insightful points that you have made. A lot of takeaways for our viewers here today. We are getting a lot of questions, so we have uh, just shortlisted three in the interest of time. Uh, the first one okay. is how important? Uh, how are important? Uh, uh, sorry, how important is social or cultural or linguist, linguistic factor in any AI program? Enormously important. Um, The biggest problem that we have with data for AI is that there is bias in the data. 
Um, we, uh, the quick example is Amazon had the machine rank all of the resumes that came in to see who might be the most successful in the company. And right. success was uh, number of promotions, the amount of uh, raises you got, how many direct reports you have. And so the machine looked at the resumes and chose white males mm -hmm. as being the most successful. Amazon said, oh, it's broken. Doesn't pass the smell test. So culture, language, these things are very important. Right, right. Next question is, uh, data comes from a large number of sources, your own third party platforms, etc. How does one integrate all of that? Painfully. <laughs> I, wish, I wish there were an answer. This is a business opportunity. If somebody can figure out a way to use machine learning to help integrate all of those data sets, boy, everybody needs that because right now we do it by hand. It is fragile. It, it breaks constantly. It is, um, it's, a, it's a business opportunity. It's also a, a professional track. Uh, that is what a data engineer does for a living. It's a marketer's nightmare kind of a thing. Yes. Uh, final question is, uh, which companies or brands are playing AI game the best, you know, on top of the AI mm -hmm. game? And any uh, that are your personal favorites in that space? Boy. Um, Everybody is playing, <laughs> not all of them successfully. Right. Um, that's an impossible question to answer. It, it's sort of like, you know, who has the best website? Uh, who ran the best ad campaign? There are some projects inside some companies that are doing really well. And then the same people in the same company can go to the next project and it doesn't work. Right. So there's no absolute, oh, always use this tool or these are the leaders in the field. There are, there are case studies, one case at a time, people get it right. But it takes a lot of work and a lot of education uh, in, in making those mistakes and learning how to make it all happen. I wish I could just give you, oh, here's the list, but boy, I'm afraid okay. not. Thank you so much, Jim, uh, for this lovely session and the fact that you're up there at 4 a.m. Uh, now time for the morning walk, I guess. And <laughs> great, great talking to you. Over to you. Thank Sanat. you so much. It's been a pleasure. Now we will move on to the next session for the day. It's a dialogue between Bharat Saurabh and Kashyap Kampela on AI for marketing in India. Uh, just a little brief about Varaj. He is the Vice President, Product Management and Marketing Technology at Manthan. His focus on creating innovative products that use analytics and deep customer insights into driving management works on personalization and targeted marketing. He has also helped uh, consumers facing businesses such as retailers, restaurants, and airlines across the global leverage, uh, across the globe, uh, leverage their data better and achieve better ROI, ROI for the marketing dollars. Kashyap is the CEO of RPA2AI. He's also the co-author uh, co of Practical Intelligence, uh, Practical Artificial Intelligence. He is an industry analyst and has advised marquee global brands in retail, high tech, telecom, and financial services on marketing, AI, and emerging tech. Uh, he has been a part of the Thinkers 360 ranks and, and is among the top 10 thought leaders globally on artificial intelligence, customer experience, and marketing technologies. He, uh, so I welcome both of you today and looking forward to this session. Kindly start with your dialogue. Thank you, Sonakshi. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Good morning and uh, good evening uh, to everybody, wherever you may be. And welcome, uh, Varaj. Look forward to an interesting uh, session. Yeah, so very happy to be here. Yep, yeah, yeah, thank you. So the format of this is I'll uh, give some, uh, I'll share some opening remarks, and then uh, we'll get into a dialogue with, uh, Sa with Bar Varaj. So, so if you're on uh, Twitter, uh, please use the tag uh, hash Martech India to share some of the highlights uh, from this uh, session. Any questions also you can uh, leave there. So this is the day two AI day of this uh, excellent uh, conference. So I was listening in some sessions yesterday and uh, Anurag, uh, Anurag Batra has made a very perceptive comment. He said, uh, AI is really nothing new. It's been around for 65 years is what he said. So that, that I agree with that. In fact, uh, marketers have been uh, doing AI. They just don't call it AI, but they've been doing it AI. When you do things like 
segmentation, personalization, clustering. I mean, marketers are using AI every day without calling it actually AI. But having said that, what's new is that uh, we now have more data than we can handle. And there are also some advances in uh, machine learning techniques itself. So that enables new possibilities and uh, new use cases. So if you look at uh, the defining graphic of the MarTech industry, which is uh, the 8,000 uh, product landscape uh, of this industry, you'll see that there are probably about a few dozen categories, 50, 60, 70, I don't remember how many, but there are some categories. You'll see that there is no specific category for AI or machine learning. That's because uh, in most of those products, AI or machine learning capabilities are getting embedded or are already embedded. So that, that's how most of the marketers experience AI through the products uh, that you buy. What I find useful though is, uh, I mean, I have an MBA in marketing, so I come from uh, a little bit of a theoretical background of marketing. So it's useful to think of the four Ps of uh, classical, uh, the classical four Ps of so there are thousands, literally thousands of use cases of AI, but it helps to look at it from the four Ps. So from the four Ps are product, pricing, promotions, and place. So you'll see that in very many products, the machine learning itself is between core to the product or the product itself. When we take self-driving cars, for example, I mean, no car can drive itself in the Indian roads at any point in time, I think. But you can see that self-driving features are becoming uh, like, parking, parking a car, parking on its own, or uh, doing paddle parking. Those are uh, becoming features of the product itself. In healthcare, still a long way to go, but uh, increasingly there is a cognitive software that assists uh, in a diagnosis and provides second opinions. In financial services, uh, you'll see that uh, credit ratings, risk profiles of audiences, of customers, they're all increasingly relying on uh, machine learning. So, and so on and so forth in product. When it comes to pricing, this is like, I mean, bread and butter for uh, marketers. It's quite mature in uh, practice. You see in verticals uh, like airlines, e-commerce and hotels. So, so this is, I mean, very well understood, I would think. So when you, next P is a promotion. And a lot of the machine learning applications that you can buy fall into this uh, category. You'll find like a lot of tools for audience segmentation, dynamic web content generation, targeted offers, discounts, campaigns, and whatnot. So here, uh, I, I think uh, we, we're seeing some pretty good advances in terms of uh, what's not possible before. The place, I mean, I found it a little confusing to think of it as place, but I think of it as the omni-channel uh, experience these days. So how and where customers look for your product, how they become aware of your product, both across physical stores and the digital channels. So AI can significantly shape these customer interactions and uh, journeys, be it in terms of recommendations, ad placements, new channels and interfaces. So that, that's the context, uh, I mean, a useful context to think in terms of uh, for what AI, what are the AI applications uh, for uh, marketers. So we've talked about the four Ps, but I think in 2020, there is a fifth P, which is the pandemic. So we find that uh, it's still early days, but it's changing uh, consumer preferences, consumer behavior, and ultimately the customer journey. So some of these behaviors are going to be longer lasting while some will be transient and will, will revert to the original behaviors. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, a little uh, later. So with that uh, context, let me invite uh, Varej. Sunakshi has already given his intro, but uh, he is with uh, Manthan Software as VP of Product Management, and he creates innovative products uh, using analytics and uh, uses customer insights, helps his uh, clients uh, undermine customer insights to drive engagement, personalization, and marketing. So he's worked with uh, a lot of B2C businesses, retailers, restaurants, and airlines across the globe to help uh, better leverage their data and achieve uh, the bang for the buck for their uh, marketing dollars. So welcome once again, Varej. So let's uh, kick off this discussion. Let me ask you, Customer journey, that, that's becoming a very important uh, topic. So what's the best way to think about customer journeys? Is there a framework to think about customer journeys? How do you look at it? Thanks, Ashok, uh, and thanks for the intro. Uh, a customer journey is definitely a topic that's gaining a lot of interest. Uh, right? And uh, uh, it started off uh, from a point of view where people were thinking about how a customer uh, would uh, 
get a issue resolved uh, when they call a call into a call center but over time it has really moved ahead and people are looking at all kinds of journeys right from how somebody downloads your app consumes it for the first time and becomes hooked to it or how does a customer engage with your brand in general right at monthen uh, because we deal more with a a longer term uh, data set where uh the problem that we are trying to solve is uh, how do you increase the the average lifetime value of a customer uh and you know the basic arithmetic is the more customers you have the more your money you can get each customer to spend with you the bigger business you have right so how uh, what's the journey that the customer is taking when they discover you they discover your products explore make their first purchase and then uh, start engaging with the brand after that first purchase and then finally you hope that most of them land up in that loyalty bucket where they are very deeply engaged with you and are uh, coming back to your business again and again are, are becoming a good champion for your business right so for us customer journey is is really this macro customer journey of how somebody uh, moves across the the entire chain right and and if you think of the kinds of analytics that each of these steps can uh, uh, can power uh, can benefit from there is actually quite a bit of diversity in in what you can do uh, when the customer is discovering you and and and, and you are trying to get them to uh, see more of your website understand more of your products uh, you are to some extent dealing a lot more with the marketplace like right? you are dealing much more in the third party world where you are trying to identify customers who are most likely to become uh, prospects or most likely to become a customer it has as jim pointed out there could be uh, uh, data science techniques that you are using to sift through incoming emails and identify the prospects that that you should really focus on right so starting from there once they are engaging with you how do you surface understand their preferences surface their uh uh their their expectations before they actually know so whether it's recommendation engines and so on uh right that really helps the customer explore and buy once they have bought the the uh, the, the products from you and then they are using it that's when you you have a lot more uh, first party data you have your own data sets and you can start understanding which segment do they belong to what kind of lifestyle do they lead what kind of uh, persona do they have and then based on that you can start looking at what sets the part what sets your best customers apart from rest of the group how can you make some of the lower engaged customers move them into that best customer bucket right so that's the kind of analysis that's the kind of questions you can start asking and and finally uh, you know, you are hoping to keep as many customers as loyal as possible so that is where looking at uh, the biggest drivers of churn when does somebody uh, disengage when do they stop by what is organic churn where uh, if you are uh, you know, for example if you are uh, selling uh, apparel for kids really there is a, a life cycle after which there will be organic churn and you should be happy about that nothing to you can't do anything to fix that but uh, how do you identify in organic churn how do you arrest it how do you preempt it and those are some of the techniques that start yeah. becoming really uh yes i think i mean these definitely are like a lot of things that that keep uh, chief marketing officers awake at night trying to crack some of these problems so marketing is a uh, pretty location or regional specific you work across both uh, international and indian clients so is there something unique or different about uh, the customer journeys in india or this landscape that you paint here that that's different it is definitely uh, uh, you know yes uh, as you pointed out each each region has its own nuances india in particular uh, you know to start with because many of us come with an engineering background i see uh, indians are much better versed with data and and data science techniques than you would see in rest of the world so it's uh, it's uh, you you are you expect a lot more pointed questions a lot more educated Any clients are tough to work so, with <laughs> well they are definitely well educated they, they do their homework 
and and, and they are uh, you know always uh, a step ahead uh, the but the marketing landscape that they work in is actually quite challenging compared at least compared to the west one of the reasons is that uh, the market data in india is is still in a place where it's getting better it's it's not quite uh, uh, it does not have the same quality same rigor that's available outside right so we see a lot more customers of our a lot more of our clients focusing a lot more on their own first party data as as the primary source of insights and uh, analytics and doing a lot less with third party uh, that's one big area and the second one i would say is more around channel engagement in the west email is still the king email is the channel that everybody uh, has to get right in india that's not the case in india phones have always been phone phones came in before the desktops so because of that sms and mobile apps have a lot more uh, penetration uh, and and with that uh, the, the challenge that uh, i see a lot of indian marketers facing is that uh, there is a lot less of policing right in, in in the email world if you send too many emails you quickly get uh, tagged as a spammer and 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 you lose your uh, reputation but with sms that has not happened to the point that uh, there is a lot of channel fatigue that has come in uh, most marketers have, are pulling back from sms as the primary channel and and i see many indian uh, businesses doing very well with mobile i think we probably have some of the best uh, case studies of mobile app and mobile app engagement in india uh, than in, in the rest of the world well i think uh, that that's a pretty good insight smarter clients smart clients more engagement on the mobile not as much on uh, email so far data is a little uh, spotty still not as uh, mature correct yeah and, and the data environment the laws around that also probably not as stringent compared to gdpr or uh, yeah absolutely and, and the indian privacy act is coming so i'm, I'm sure that yeah, will change fun. a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, and then hopefully uh, the data quality would get better Uh, because there would be a lot more explicit uh, intent from the customer to share that data so one of my favorite questions to ask uh, all analytics experts i mean invariably I always ask them because uh, when i hear i mean analytics uh, people say oh yeah we already knew this it just validated it so i want to know from you were there any aha moments in your work saying hmm, this this is very interesting we wouldn't have known without uh, analytics what are those aha moments tell us a bit yeah actually there are uh, quite a few uh, my favorite one was uh, uh, with a client who was doing a lot of email and and their challenge email. was on subscription rates uh, they were seeing at least 1 to 2% of their customers unsubscribe every month right and given that it's a compounding problem uh, you you start losing your your customer base uh, your contactable customer base very quickly right so the problem the cmo threw at us was to explain or to understand why and when does somebody unsubscribe and what they could do to fix it uh when we uh when we threw the data into our system and we were running some of those uh, likelihood to churn likelihood to unsubscribe algorithms uh, so the the biggest insight for me was uh, that uh, the the typical marketer's behavior actually makes the problem worse if a customer is not responding if the if the customer does not respond to two of your emails the marketer's first reaction is to send two more and and, and see if, if that would get that uh, click right uh, but what our data showed was that uh, the the uh, the uh, the days since last purchase right that's the the metric that we were looking at uh, and and the longer it has been for a customer Uh, since the last transaction, the more likely they are to churn, and we actually saw distinct steps in in about ninety days, one eighty days, when that likelihood increased. So, so our uh, most uh, you know our our feedback to them was that if a customer has not bought in six months, you have to really cut down and you have to really reduce the number of communications you are sending to them and and just focus on quality at that point. a number of communications are actually hurting you than helping and based on that insight they completely changed their journey marketing uh, strategy and that helped them quite a bit in bringing out that unsubscription rates another one which is 
more of an oho and not an aha oh, is <laughs> is <laughs> around, <your> <laughs> uh, you know how many of your customers are actually just a one timer or or somebody who has shopped a couple of times but is not really engaging with your brand and if these are some of the automated things that that's me most of the time i pick up a discount coupon and then disappear after yeah, <laughs> no <yeah>. discounts <laughs> so while everyone acknowledges the problem uh, the extent of it is is where uh, you know we we saw with one of our indian clients where uh, for example about 70% of the customers had just done one or two transactions right and and uh, this was when they when the marketing team saw this insight for the first time uh they did not believe it you know it was a very classic case of how a group of people go through those five stages of belief of the of of grief starting with ang disbelief the anger and then finally acceptance uh so it's it's just you know getting a, a sense of what's your 80 20 right 80% of your customers are, are going to be in, in that very uh, low value bucket but that 20 person of the customers who are in your long tail and are spending a lot with you are, are really the ones who are most valuable right so uh, being able to get this insight uh, to the cmo to the point that he actually made sure that thousands of those customers were called to validate if they have changed their phone numbers or addresses or is there a data glitch because of which they were coming out as as one timers right and only after that he accepted uh, what what we were, had to say Uh, let me actually uh, you know throw a question to you here uh, uh, in that in uh, uh, you know as an industry analyst you have been looking at a number of different industries and how ai is moving do you see certain companies or industries doing this well getting on the uh, ai uh, uh, driven growth better than than some of the other companies yes, yes. No, that's an interesting question because i have been looking at ai case studies and go to so many sessions conferences and the number one uh, ai application that always comes back is amazon amazon is only company <laughs> and amazon's recommendations that that seems to be the case that can a joke apart uh, so i get a lot of calls uh, from clients saying particularly this happens at the end of the year saying hey we need to have a an ai roadmap for the next year types so maybe get talking so i explain okay ai is really nothing but a machine learning model application is nothing but the data that you train on so do you have data where are you in your current stage so it when it's like same as calling it will be like okay we need to have ai in marketing types so not, do you have a marketing automation in system in place do you have where is the data etc i try to figure out these questions when it turns out i mean usually people are in various stages so they, they are probably i mean many of the times it turns out that people are trying to implement a crm application i mean those are just my clients maybe so we say okay let's put the basics in place this year and we'll talk next year so this sounds like a little bit uh, facetious but that that that's what happens so what i find is that uh, i find that a lot of uh, companies are struggling to implement foundational marketing technology tools but at the same time because of the media hype because of the external and pressure from top they're expected to be ready for new ai applications that are way more complex having said that in general there are certain industries uh, that are early adopters of technology that invest in new technologies emerging technologies innovation etc so banking and financial services e-commerce to an extent so and high tech media they the adoption of ai also trends to mirror uh, that uh, pattern as well so banking and financial services they are regulated but they have it still a little easier because their products are not as much physical or omnichannel it's a digital product we can uh, play around uh, with that a little bit so so those are uh, some of the things uh, that we see but in general marketing you know, a lot of marketers like you said i mean not just in india but everywhere they have a sort of quantitative background they understand data so they are able to appreciate what is possible with ai what is not possible ai what are the narrow use cases they should uh, look at at this point in so that that's uh, what uh, we find so any specific tech trends you would uh, highlight that uh, that attention broadly this this is uh, applicable to a broad swath of uh, companies in different industries data is the biggest challenge data is the biggest challenge because uh, the systems are siloed and uh, to be able to run machine learning models you needed to have collected data in a specific manner 
even if you had uh, data warehouses running for the last 10 years or so to be able to get that data integrated with other data stores and label it put it in a way that you can use is uh, a very difficult task time consuming a lot of uh, effort uh, goes in like i said data scientists they say is like uh, this is one of the success jobs of the 20th century or the 21st century but only if you're not doing it and somebody else is doing it is <laughs> because bulk of the effort goes into that so data is a big challenge then uh, right. there is uh, definitely this technology complexity this access to expertise there is a certain machine learning way of thinking things to translate business problems into machine learning problems but expertise problem is easily solvable because they can either hire you or me <laughs> we can uh, solve that uh, problem yeah so that, that's the experience of one so in some it's still early days uh, for using some of the newer uh, machine learning uh, techniques so uh, so that that i mean i keep talking about the what is possible there is an enormous list of use cases etc so how do you select what you do where do you start in this journey of uh, trying to use ai yeah the way uh, so the uh, uh, my suggestion to, to most of the marketers would be to just map out how customers are moving through this journey uh, right and, and and start looking at uh, where your biggest Uh, step is where your customers are are they buying and not coming back or are you getting the traffic and, and not the transaction right so once you understand the gap that automatically becomes the uh, from a business perspective that's the the the, uh, the head at which you have to really work at uh, when when you're looking at the tech stack as you mentioned we actually have a uh, we flip the flow and have a slightly different way of thinking about it which is um, we we break it into sort of a six layer problem right obviously the the foundational layer is customer data uh, then then you get into how do you segment customers what kind of insights are you able to derive how do you measure marketing outcome how do you personalize and then finally what level of optimization are you able to achieve in an automated manner and so we we typically ask our, our clients and prospects to score them on this uh, framework Uh, on each of the row, where do they see themselves as uh, beginners or or level three as as a as a pro? Right, and that sort of immediately starts throwing some uh, some some light on where their challenges could be. Is it uh, just do they have all the data in place, but but they're not using it today, and and they could directly pick up some personalization tools, or uh, are they personalizing? But a lot of uh, the complexity of the business is not reflecting in the data right uh, as with the pandemic every organization is now an omni channel digital first business so many of the retailers are thinking how do i take my off 80% of offline customers online so if your data is not connected uh, right so you might have done a lot, a lot of fancy work in online by itself but now how do you bring that offline data and and also connected and and get customers to know right so normally when when somebody scores them on this framework that also immediately starts throwing some ideas on uh, the techniques the 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 tech stack that they should invest in i think interesting that you mentioned the pandemic because what we are seeing is that i mentioned before that it is uh, changing some customer preferences and uh, behavior so machine learning is also dependent on uh, the data on which it is trained i mean you need large amounts of uh, data to be training these models on now suddenly see if you take recommendations engine the data on which it has been trained is not as applicable in this current period so people buy different things people buy different quantities what's in the basket is different why they buy is different so it's really interesting to see that uh, machine learning uh, models are uh, not as applicable to a crisis situation like this so that's one point the second point also to note is that uh, customer journeys customer i mean companies are having to change their customer journey they take a simple example of uh, say buying uh, clothes online so people one, one big problem in clothes is you are always worried whether it will fit you or not so that's why i mean you find a lot of uh, returns easy returns is the hallmark of uh, 
a lot of good uh, online shoppers but now because of uh, the hygiene reasons people don't want to return goods so all of a sudden that that step of the customer journey is uh, broken so it happens online it happens in retail also so a lot of uh, questions uh, related to where is really machine learning models where are applicable how do you realize that this is no longer applicable or it's going back to business as usual when when do we do that so there are very interesting uh, questions uh, to think about second do you have any thoughts on that or uh, so uh, one on the quality uh, how has pandemic changed the the value of analytics uh, well yes obviously if if you were looking at last 5 years of uh, data to figure out who your best customers have been uh, that model is not going to be very helpful right now uh but at the same time you have uh, uh certain techniques that require very a uh, very little data or most recent data right for example uh, uh buying hand sanitizers nobody has bought as many uh, earlier but when you start browsing for it you can immediately make a sense uh, you know get a that sniff that this person is looking to sanitize their house and and their cars right so that immediately that just last three or five clicks might be enough to tell you what's on on mind for this customer in this particular uh, trip that they are on right so yes uh, there are certain techniques that become less important more important in, in turbulent times uh, uh, but you know you, you have to pick uh, the 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 battles and and make sure that you are working with data that's more recent and you are trying to solve problems that that uh, today's problem and not really a long term problem uh, totally. that's what you should be doing in in a uh, you know phase like like what we are in in 2020 so if i were to summarize what you said you're saying like ai can also be used to respond faster because absolutely in yes. a situation like this yeah. so i tend to agree with that but but that calls for i mean being agile agile ai is what we are uh, talking about so uh, i want to look at a couple of uh, questions uh, that have come in so this talked about uh, apurva asks uh, ai can be used uh, in customer journeys can it also be used for defining customer journeys or influencing them so my short answer is uh, i mean ai or ai techniques are mostly used for uh, identifying customer journeys and then uh, sort of uh, making sure that the customer experience uh, that you're delivering matches to that customer journey that you identified your thought yes uh, so you know earlier uh, i think jim uh, pointed out that uh, when you have unsupervised learning techniques you are throwing a lot of data at the engine and you are asking the engine to find a pattern so that is uh, those are the techniques that can help uh, you identify the journeys that the customers are on uh because you are not really thought about what journeys the customers are making uh and and are going through uh, you know, just throw the data and and get some longitudinal analysis of how most of the customers are performing so in that sense ai uh, or analytics in general can help you identify what your dominant journeys are right and then uh, reinforcement learning techniques can actually help you start experimenting and tweaking and making sure that you are impacting the journeys towards some much more favorable outcome right? so definitely different uh, you know uh, tunes for for different answers is that sort of it thank you varish thank you kashyap for this lovely discussion we have a lot of questions but we are short on time maybe we can take it offline uh, and then get them answered thank you again for this lovely conversation thank you thank you hail thank you varish thank you it's been great learning for me Thank you, Thank you Prashant Maraj. Uh we Thank now you. move on to the next session for the day which is a success story CX and hospitality and martech. We have with us Mr Prasad Ayer he is the vice president digital e-commerce distribution and awards at Lemon Tree Hotels. Uh he is a digital and e-commerce professional with a master's degree in business administration and e-business marketing. with over 17 years of experience in senior management positions across digital e-commerce and e-business he has taken proficient proficiency in leading efforts to provide key insights into the development of digital marketing and e-commerce digital transformation projects 
online sales, marketing strategies, revenue support, and implementation plans for online media campaigns. He has a proven track record of outstanding ac uh, accomplishments in diverse, competitive, high pressure, and evolving environments. Um, he's responsible for Indian Hotel Company, uh, its digital initiatives, including digital marketing, social media, and ORM, web and mobile uh, platforms, digital transformation projects, and he is also the head of Digital Center of Excellence to enhance guest facing as well as associate facing technologies. So over to you, Rohail. And thank you, thank you, Sonak. Thank you, Sonak. Uh, thank you, Prasad, for being here. Uh, we had a chat earlier, also. You know, it's, it's something I was looking forward to. Um, you know, I mean, uh, when we talk about customer experience, uh, of course, you know, there are demands and challenges in every sector, but in your sector especially. Customer experience is not compared to, it's, it's a different ball game altogether. I think the expectations are not higher in, in this uh, hospitality industry and which has been now impacted and you are trying to recreate those experiences through technology, which also means uh, there is no verbal communication. The aura is not around, you know, all that warmth is not around. And yet you have to make sure, you know, you deliver on those fronts. And tell me, first of all, uh, how is... Uh, your industry dealing with this uh, demand that tech has to solve these uh, you know, situations in front of you? That's a wonderful question to start off with, Soil. And again, thank you for having me here with this panel. And, um, you know, uh, the hospitality industry is, is always sort of uh, overlooked when it comes to tech. It's also a chicken and egg story. It's largely because um, if you statistically look at tech adaption in in, in um, adoption in general, uh, hospitality and travel has always been the slowest adopter of tech in general. Uh, largely also because uh, the business is such that it's very capital intensive. The operational expenses or OPEX is very high. And most of it is, is, is towards keeping, keeping the, the physical structure up and running. Right? Service delivery is largely to do with people. So... Um, the cost also sort of largely uh, uh, is is full is full of uh, um, wages, for instance, as an expense, right? And and that's largely also because it, it, the industry is such as service based. Um, having said that, I mean the the industry that's hit the worst or hit the hardest uh, through the pandemic has been travel and hospitality. Um, our business is largely also dependent on the airline. Thankfully uh, for us. Uh, and, and, and the company that, that, that I work for now and, and represent uh, on this call with Lemon Tree Hotels, um, we've, been, we, we've been managing at about 25 to 30% occupancy even now, even given the current situation. It's largely because um, we work closely with the Indian government on, on many things, with, whether it is uh, with the Ministry of Health with regards to asymptomatic quarantiners whether it's business continuity plans that, that a lot of tech companies use us for, whether it is uh, medical staff and support services that, that use us through the course of, of the, the lockdown as well. We've been able to sustain this business very well. And um, invariably, uh, we've also sort of gone a little lean with regards to how we spend. Uh, the, the industry, in any case, is, is, keeps its, its digital spends uh, um, largely from a B2C or a, or a go-to-market uh, uh, strategy perspective. But in the larger scheme of things, I think where most of the spends are coming now um, are largely from companies trying to sort of future-proof themselves, um, as opposed to sort of really looking at conversion-based uh, investments in, this current, in the current scheme of things. Does that answer your question? Absolutely, absolutely. Tell me, um, this quick adjustment, this nimble footedness that is required to adjust to this uh, scenario and make your customers secure. Uh, from the tech side, can you tell me what Lemon Tree is doing? Uh, what are the new technologies you have been deploying to make sure that uh, that customer connect remains, you know, that Martech, uh, you know, that that side is developed and it is contemporary. It delivers the kind of solutions that you want. Another interesting question, but let me, I, I mean, I'll give you the easy version first. I'll just tell you what it is that we as a company sort of are doing and what, where the aspiration value and uh, value is and where we intend to take this. 
uh, for starters, about a few months ago, thankfully, we we set off on on setting up the new CRM system. I heard uh, Kashyap and and Virat speak uh, a lot with regards to sort of you know setting up the base and 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 largely knowing your customers a little better and the dearth of data, if I may say so. Um, we still need to sort of run a proper KYC because that's where we are. We are still in a position, and I would I would sort of. Uh, very comfortably assume that that's where most of the other uh, companies in, in, in the hospitality and travel uh, space are as well, largely because the volume of um, the database is such, right? It, it's, uh, we may have five points uh, out of 20 uh, that, are, that are known to us, but we may still sort of not necessarily have the other 15 points that requires us to sort of set a profile and then personalize or customize because I think words like personalization is sort of thrown around quite a bit in there. And in order to sort of add the cherry on top it and, and, and sensationalize it a little bit more, I think people speak uh, about AI and personalization in the same breath. I think we're still far away from it. Um, with regards to sort of, I think step one would always be to sort of have a strong backbone CRM platform, right? Step two is to sort of really uh, get all your data points and, and, and a complete and a thorough KYC done for your customers, their likes, their dislikes, their preferences, um, meal preferences, vegetarian, non-vegetarian, allergies, so on, so forth, smoking, non-smoking. I think the list is endless because ideally when we have that is when we can sort of really make use of it, right? Preferences are, are, are something that, that go a long way in the travel and hospitality space. And it's, it's something that, that we expect uh, the company that we choose, whether it's an airline or a hotel company, to know that about us. We, we, we often hear things like, uh, oh, you know, I stay with you a dozen times a year or I stay with you every month. Uh, you should know this by now. The problem and the reality of the matter is not every, every company has got that right. Unless it's, it's probably about 0.5% of your total platinum guests who might know it. And that's about it. And that too requires a whole lot of uh, on-ground service delivery. So what we've done is we've invested well in, in, in a... In a, in a good CRM system uh, um, that's starting to fire on all cylinders. Uh, but unfortunately, we've had to sort of uh, um, put a few roadblocks in there largely because we want to sort of do this when, uh, when it's, it's, it's safe to travel again. Let me put it that way. So while you are putting the CRM in place, what does the front side look like, the customer facing side? For example, I read that you know, people can now, when, once they reach hotels, they don't have to go to the desk. They will be checking in directly. They will be ordering contactless meals. So what does the customer facing end look like in a new CRM? It's, it's, it's again, it's, uh, again, this is ideally where we, reality meets fiction. And, and I want to sort of really put that into perspective as well. There are companies that I've worked for in the past that, that uh, have sort of piloted this to a massive extent. In fact, I've been a part of some of these pilots, which, which include uh, keyless entry, web check-in, mobile check-in, um, uh, and so on and so forth, right? The idea is these pilots at that point in time, which was the pre-pandemic time, uh, the adoption rate was negligible. People still preferred the touch and feel uh, uh, key card. They still prefer to go speak to the hostess at the front desk. They still prefer to sort of um, have someone usher them around to the room and so on and so forth. But I think the pandemic ha and, and the post-COVID world is going to be slightly different. Um, I'm still optimistic, uh, or call me pessimistic if you must, but I see a lot of this going back to the way it was, right? I still, um, I think a, a, an important part about hosp of hospitality is, 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 is that smile, you know, that, that greeting that, that is, that is ideally what makes it all better. That justifies the price tag, that justifies your arrival experience, that justifies the pre-stay, post-stay, in-stay, and all of it. I still don't see that going away completely, and that'll continue, that'll eventually come back, and I hope it does for all of us. Um, but realistically, keyless entry requires us to do a whole lot of things. It's not as simple as just creating a mobile app and, and, and figuring out the property management system, which again is a big CapEx investment, and to have to change, let's say, elementary hotels today uh, has 8,000 rooms, 8,000 keys. That's 8,000 keys for us to change locks on. It's not as simple as just changing the RFID uh, on the lock and, and not as simple as just creating 
a mobile application that can talk to that RFID lock. It 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 requires a whole lot of things. It also sort of threads on the lines of uh, security, for instance, right? Um, a fr uh, even I think proof of identity proof and photo identity is something that's still required. There are companies that have actually done this. We piloted this ourselves, but is it easy? Is it going to sort of be done overnight? Absolutely not. It's going to take it's going to take time, but I definitely see that having its own niche and its own takers definitely over the next 18 months and even more sure over the next, you know, three years or so, I see this becoming a reality across the board. But in North America and Europe, I, we see uh, the, the usage being quite high. Um, but also, I think that that depends on the kind of customer service that uh, customers in, in, let's say, our part of the world expect versus customers in North America and Europe would expect because for them, contact less might be okay. I, I say this with experience because I've traveled extensively during my time with Marriott, to these parts of the world. We like people opening doors for us. We like people taking our bags up to our rooms and so on and so forth. But I, I, I don't think they might, it, it, it's the same in North America and Europe, right? So I think we, this is definitely the need of the hour, but with, whether all hotel companies have an appetite of putting that level of capital expenditure given the current recession uh, uh, that we are in, I think uh, I think it, it, it's 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 a matter of time, but it'll it'll eventually come there. But it's it's going to take its time. Right. So one one side of the conversation is that the solution being offered by hotels and the industry to customers. The other side of the conversation is the acceptance of the solution by absolutely. Customers. That's also important because, as you said earlier, you know, they like people to open the doors. They like to be served, to be greeted. You know, I think they're looking for it. They're not coming to a robotic place. Tell me, while you're offering this solution, uh, what has been your uh, understanding of the customer acceptance of this, these solutions? Are they okay with it? Do you need to build it further? Are you just made to keep, keeping it as a temporary arrangement? What is it like? So, like I said, we haven't gone full board with this because currently while it's, it's still on the drawing board for us, but as, as, as a customer myself, I see myself using some of these products. I see myself using a hotel company app that I, I use very frequently. But yeah. this is largely, again, only going to be to that subset of customers that use your services or use your hotel uh, more than, let's say, 12 times a year or maybe four times a year even, if, if that was the case. But in terms of adoption, I still, I, I still think that people will want to sort of stay conventional because I think we, we tend to believe things that we can touch and feel as opposed to things that we don't touch and feel. God, for instance, right? Um, uh, but in the larger scheme of things, uh, uh, key cards and things uh, are, are sort of slowly getting replaced. Uh, we are trying a few things with regards to sort of uh, uh, trying to sort of find an alternate solution to, to sort of having as much contactless service delivery as possible. Uh, like I said, there, are, there is probably only a handful of hotels in this part of the world, in India at least, that, that give you contactless, contactless service. Um, it's largely because adoption rate is another story altogether. Uh, you, I remember uh, when Bombay had its, uh, its, its first metro, Reliance had Reliance Industries that, that, that set this up here, Reliance uh, had to sort of deploy about a thousand people across just seven or eight stations just to show people how to use the token system. It's because it was, it was overnight that it was opened and people weren't really sure even how to use escalators, for instance, right? So I think this needs to be administered. This is, uh, although it, it seems simple, simple to most of us because we are, we are active users ourselves, but I think uh, bringing uh, usability is, is, is something that I think is also another form of data that we, that we will need to eventually connect, uh, collect, um, uh, filter, siphon, and so on and so forth in order to sort of really figure out and think, do we really need it, right? Because want is one thing. I think everyone wants something or the other. I want a Ferrari. Uh, uh, do I need a Ferrari is a different story. Do I need a Ferrari in Bombay is another story. Can I afford a Ferrari is, is, is a later question to be asked. And similarly with, with mobile applications, with, with chatbots and so on and so forth, um, call, call all of these things uh, MarTech solutions, if you may. Uh, 
I think wanting something is very different to justifying the need for it. You need to have the data to substantiate the need, right? Just because we have, uh, um, or a particular hotel company has 350 restaurants, doesn't mean that everyone's going to download your app and start ordering the food online, right? But but I'm fairly certain that this particular company might have sort of run. Um, a survey, something as simple as a survey and saying, let's just go out and ask three and a half thousand people out of the 35 lakh members that you have and saying, if we were to put an application which allowed you to order group, order food uh, from the comfort of your home, would you, would you get it, right? Similarly, uh, if, if we were to do that, that's the approach I would take because that prevents you from, from plowing that, that limited capital expenditure you have into something else. And we all know that uh, tech in hospitality or, or tech in general depreciates much faster than, than physical assets, right? The shelf life of uh, uh, an application is, is only going to be limited to the, uh, to the time that it's actively getting used. And then eventually there's time for upgrades, time for, for rebuilding it, repurposing it, not to speak uh, about the operational expenses or the, the marketing expenses that one needs to sort of plow in in order to convince users to actually start using the, the platform. So the spiral continues and I think the appetite is not just for today, it needs to be there for the next five to 10 years at least. What you put out today is ideally gonna create a foundation for you for the next five to 10 years. What we're doing in the current scheme of things, thankfully we do have time on hand to, to sort of di divert our energies towards finding auxiliary revenues but also towards future proofing ourselves and saying, what is it that we really need versus what is it that we actually want? Uh, there's a, that that, that need, question needs to be answered before we really start talking about, you know, where is, where is the business going? Right. So would you agree if I ask you that, uh, you know, when it comes to a MarTech solution uh, to hospitality, there's a limited solution that you can offer. You cannot totally say market can provide a solution, unlike other sectors, maybe, for example, an FMCG or other. Do you think that, would you agree with this, that yes, it can provide solution, but maybe, for example, loyalty, engagement, connect, but it cannot be the alternative. It cannot totally solve the problem for the industry. Spot on, Ruel. I think, I think you, you, you got it right. In fact, I think that was a rhetorical question for me. You've answered it uh, yourself. Yes. Um, hospitality, again, is a very touch and feel service. I think people like to talk to people, people like to meet people and so on and so forth. So, uh, certain, let, let's just take an example, bots, for instance, right? Uh, is, is that going to replace uh, customer service for loyalty or, or, or in general? It's not. not, not in the hospitality space. If it was a very uh, binary product, let's say a static device like a mobile phone, for instance, or, or, or a pen, or or any, 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 anything that does not have too many moving parts in it, it's easy. It, it, I mean, I think MarTech has a whole lot of plug and play solutions that, that, uh, that, that can solve for it. Uh, but, you know, anything like booking a, a stay to a certain extent, yes. But beyond a certain point, I think we'd have to draw a line because um, I think questions that come our way usually are, are more people centric and, and more from the heart than they are necessarily from the mind. Now. I think binary systems uh, can sort of usually answer everything that comes with a yes, no, or a one and zero. But anything that, that, that has the, the concept of maybe in there, which is, uh, I think you need something that can actually reason with, with the customer, right? And, then, and if, if a system was able to reason, I think we've all collectively uh, identified and created uh, artificial intelligence, as, as one may call it. But... In the larger scheme of things, no. Um, in fact, we spoke uh, uh, the other day uh, and even this afternoon. Uh, the best example is BFSI, uh, I heard, was, was a, a good adopter of fake. I tried to renew my own auto insurance day before yesterday uh, with a particular uh, insurance company. I'm not going to name them. Um, I called their customer support system because there was variance between the premium I had to pay versus the premium they suggested I had to pay. I called them, their IVR suggested that I go to the website. I went to the website, their website said that I can do this easily on their app. I went to their app, their app eventually uh, introduced me to their chatbot. Um, their chatbot couldn't even generate an, uh, an OTP. 
and it said oh why don't you call us and i was like i just came through this entire circle and you're sending me back there you know what i'm just i'm getting a little tired and a little frustrated i'm going to sort of go conventional call uh, an agent tell him to find me the best insurance pay that was done in 15 minutes right uh, in the larger scheme of things and and what is important uh, here is not that uh, they didn't have a tool they had a tool i think they had all the good intention of having a tool in the current scheme of things where having people at their call centers may or may not work but the problem is because they didn't sort of have all their ducks in a row or they didn't have a safety net or they didn't have a contingency plan they've just sort of lost let's say a lack worth of insurance premium right they've lost a customer um in the larger scheme of things i would look at that as opportunity cost uh because it's not the investment that that I'm so worried about at this time but what worries me more is loss of revenue now i can't sort of expose my loyalty customers people who really like my 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 hotels they swear by it they they love everything about it it, it has taken us quite a lot of effort time uh, money to acquire this customer now i'm going i'm i'm not necessarily going to risk losing that customer to a machine uh because the machine couldn't speak a particular language or the machine couldn't reason with it or sim- the machine simply was unavailable right so with having said that i would much rather save that 20 or 30000 rupee uh per license and plow it towards another person right I, because i think a person would be able to reason reason with me and saying you know what we are sorry even even something as simple as giving me a real apology would would have would have resolved it but it doesn't so in many things uh, royal to answer your question no not really i think hospitality will continue to have uh, people although i mean there are a few companies who who do a good job at it marriott for one does a good job with their bots but that's largely for employment um and and yeah i think that that uh, representation is good perfect so so we are all waiting for this normal to come back and uh, of course it will come back we don't know how soon how late but it will be there once it comes back what will be carried from this phase to that new normal i mean what would be the addition in the offerings that you had before covid once we go back to to the normal stage what will stick to us what would be adapted by the hospitality players especially for example your company no that's a that's again a good question and this is something that my you know our managing director mr pratu keswani uh, strongly talks about because he's probably the best version of a human reddit you will ever find out there um, he pre selects a good amount of readings for us and sends it to us everything from from you know uh, pre pandemic to post pandemic and what how we will sustain going forward um there's a whole lot of uh, cost saving measures that we as a company have taken through time you know these are not necessarily r- related to uh, cost savings uh, b- by by downsizing uh, the human resource of it it's uh, we, we're not talking about that at all we're talking about basic expenses that we would otherwise take for granted right um, lemon tree as a part of its sustainability initiative does a whole lot of things as well right where i mean you'll always see these little things uh, out there with regards to how we conserve water how we conserve electricity how we conserve fuel how we conserve energy energy as a whole a lot of good learnings have come in here do we re- again this is again a want versus a need piece uh, we would want all our customers to sort of have 21 degrees but the ministry of health otherwise tells us that you know what 26 degrees is what you have to set it at so some of these these learnings have come in as a result of Uh, a lot of trial and error and and the necessity itself so uh, in in the larger scheme of things speaking about tech uh, we realized that we do not need to spray and pray anymore right i think uh, kashyap and and uh, viraj spoke about emails still being a big uh, um and and a and a very good uh, uh, source of communication in the west in india unfortunately it is more a spray and pray mechanism which we don't believe in we believe in doing tactical stuff which i don't need to send out uh, 1.2 million emails to 1.2 million uh, 12 lakh uh, 12 lakh members that i have you know um, i might be able to sort of do that with 400000 for instance 
uh, a lot of these little little things we sort of looking at people's conversion ratios open rates so on so forth all sorts of manageable data that we can find uh, given that there is a scarcity of data in fact if if i can just share my screen i'm currently running uh, bivariate tests on three three of three versions of my website because i want to figure out which version works best but do i have enough data to sort of tell me that option a is better than option b versus option c it, it currently doesn't right um and i only sort of did this now because i didn't have slides to share but uh, because i wanted this to be a more open conversation but yeah in the larger scheme of things we are trying to do this uh, do as much as we can uh, given the current um uh measures we've taken to sort of really control costs but like i said we're also sort of building this strong crm system in the background uh just so that we are future ready so when it's time for all of us to travel again um and and i hope that that's really soon largely with with a lot of selfish interest for 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 the industry as well um i think uh you will receive um communication which is more suited for you as opposed to just a simple spray and pray mechanism that we are more accustomed to so i think uh, we'll retain a whole lot of these cost cutting measures uh, they're not cost cutting actually they're just call them efficient measures for for lack of a better word right 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 great i mean um, of course i think it's going to be more specific more tailor made the communication now uh, i mean it's going to be the offerings are, are going to be very very different than it was earlier i have uh, time for one final question uh, if i have to ask you personally uh, as the leader as somebody who is a tech evangelist who who understands technology for, from the hospitality sector what what have been your learnings from this phase and what would you as a person you know like to suggest advice to people who are in the hospitality tech side i'm 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 i i have a strong uh, belief with regards to having hope right i think uh, it's it's important that all of us continue to have hope you can't give up uh, on anything you can't give up on yourself you can't give up on the business that you're in because i mean i'm saying this from as as a hospitality professional who's probably hit the hardest right uh, uh, personally and in general i think all 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 my peers and my colleagues in in this space would sort of agree that um it, we are very passionate about what we do we love it uh, we love it you know we 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 like the concept of what what hotels are about what resorts are about uh, the whole idea of having to get on an aircraft and go to another city and sort of stay in a particular hotel have stories about that there's a lot uh, that goes into it as well but you know what what most companies and and i'll tell you that what what my team and and the marketing team at lemontry hotels is currently strongly working towards is largely come life coming full circle and us still trying uh, you know we we we're trying to sort of fulfill maslow's uh, basic hygiene factors right we we are sort of still fulfilling the lower pyramid of maslow's theory of hierarchy where we still have to convince people that you know it's it's safe uh, we have to feed the customer's mind as opposed to his heart and his soul right um uh, aspirational marketing is something that a lot of brands within the country luxury brands do this very well you know they 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 try and and sort of send that message more to your heart and your soul but i think what's become more important is sort of keeping it real uh making uh, making sure that we are feeding enough information that is good enough for the mind to make a decision uh, with regards to his choice of brands products uh, hotels airlines whichever but in the larger scheme of things i think we find ourselves um just conveying that message across we have our own uh, safety and hygiene program called rest assured where we partnered with one of the largest uh, sanitization players on the planet because we know that uh, people will need that and that's still uh, ironically still a hygiene factor uh, even if it's 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 as simple as that so i think uh, we i'm i'm done telling people to sort of stay safe in fact the only thing that i want to wish everyone under the on, on the planet today is to start traveling safe because i think we have vested interest in everyone traveling again and hopefully traveling safely and and making the right choices and still taking care of themselves thank you prasad for this wonderful conversation and unfortunately like we do in hospitality i can't shake hands with you but yes 
waiting for that. I no, look forward to it. And thanks again for your time. Likewise. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Prasad. Thank you, Rahil. We move on to the next session, which is the last session for the day. We have with us Alan Pelshock. He is the founder of Deep Analysis and co-author of Practical Artificial Intelligence and Enterprise Playbook. Um, Alan has over 25 years of experience in the IT industry, working with a wide variety of end-user organizations like FedEx, the Mayo Clinic, and Alistate, and vendors from Oracle and IBM to startups around the world. Um, Alan was formerly a partner at the Real Story Group, uh, consulting director at Indian Services firm Wipro. He was also research director at 451 and VP for North America at industry analyst firm Obum. He is regularly quoted in the press, including the Wall Street Journal and The Guardian, and has appeared on the BBC, CNBC, ABC as an expert guest. Welcome, Alan. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. I am actually having a few problems with um, Zoom right at the moment, but um, don't worry, we'll get it figured and we'll get started with or without slides. Um, so video going on here. Yes. So hi there. So whether I have slides or not, don't worry about it. We'll get going. Um, so it's been really, really interesting listening to the sessions this morning. And I think they um, blend together rather well. We talked a lot about AI, a topic that's very familiar to me. And in fact, I'm the co-author with Cash Up, uh, who spoke earlier of the AI uh, playbook. And um, I think there was some great stuff there. But rounding sort of out here, what I wanted to talk about today was um, really the human element and the practical elements of um, customer experience, digital marketing, et cetera. Because I think we live in a world where it, it's very, very possible and very likely actually to think that um, it's all about tech. And it's definitely not. And um, the last uh, session there, um, Prasant, uh, talked talk very eloquently about how technology only plays a part. So if we go forward here, and as I say, I'll play around in, in the background here and try and get my slides going. But um, our focus typically is always on the concept of um, delighting customers, right? customer experience. It's all about making it wonderful for the customer. And uh, we want everybody to be happy. And that all makes perfect sense. That's all a wonderful thing. But here's the thing. Your most unhappy customer is likely to be the one who gives you the most trouble. Um, they're going to have a lot more impact on your business than anybody else. Um, and here's the thing. If we focus on always delighting our customers, giving them the best possible experience, nurturing leads, uh, nurturing prospects, keeping going, that's good. But you're gonna have very few loud evangelists for your product or service. I mean, even those who are really happy with you, seldom are going to bother to re leave a review or even possibly recommend you. Uh, they're not going to go out their way to do that. Some will, and that's a wonderful thing, and you should definitely do your best to, uh, to look after them. But those who you really annoy will likely go out of their way to post a bad review, um, to not recommend you, to tell people to avoid you. So when we talk about customer experience management, when we talk about you know, the whole concept of digital marketing and enhancing a, a customer experience, we have to remember that experiences are both good and bad um, or indifferent, right? So the reason I'm bringing this up now is not to be just sort of miserable and to give you all a hard time. Um, the reason I'm sort of bringing this up now is to really express how important it is at this time with um, so much political upheaval, with you know, COVID-19, everything's going on, not many people are happy, uh, many people are looking for targets for their anger and their frustration. So handling your customer experience today is different 
Um, that's for sure. I think we can all recognize that. And moving forward, you need to have some kind of strategy for how to deal with, yes, um, this current crazy situation that we're living in, but also to become more adaptable as we move forward. And that's really where um, things like AI, which has been talked about a lot this morning and is a topic very close to my heart, can play a, 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 an important role. But I think it was Kashyap who actually pointed out that, well, it's only as good as your data. And the data it's getting now, or any AI or machine learning system is getting now, is somewhat skewed, um, maybe even very, very skewed. So what we can't do is lose touch with the customers. Um, I'm sorry, Alan, Alan, sorry, just one yes. second. Your video is completely off, your screen is blank. Can you just check? Okay, me? I will refresh it. Is that working? No, we cannot it's... see you, the screen is completely black. Brilliant. Yes. That's wonderful. Well, isn't that great? Well, you know, you're not missing much. Um, there is that. Um, is that any better? Yes, yes, we're back. Okay, I just switched it on and off again twice. So, but that's a, that's a very technical maybe, thing. Maybe to you do. can you try a screen sharing now. Oh. Maybe you can try a screen sharing now if it works. Okay, let's at least try. I'm sorry about this. Is that coming up? No. No. I'm sorry. Well, it's not happening, I'm afraid, on this end. Is the video coming back up? Yeah, you are back. Okay. Okay. Well, I've got a nice new shirt on, so um, that's what we'll have to do. I'm so sorry. Um, there's been some problems with Zoom this morning. The sound's been dropping in and out um, throughout for me. Um, but we'll, we'll do the best we can with the time we've got. So anyway, the, the long story short, you need to start thinking about a post-pandemic uh, strategy and learning from this and figuring out what you're going to do in future. Um, we talk about the new norm. We have no idea what that, that will look like. And we don't know what, what twists and turns are coming around the corner. So the thing is, um, you know, I'm a technologist, um, I'm an industry analyst, a technology market analyst, um, whatever we want to call me. Um, but I also trained as a psychotherapist. So I'm a sort of an odd breed here. And if there's one thing I've learned is that um, technologists, certainly hardcore technologists, really don't like to talk to people very much. Um, that's sort of part of the DNA here. And I probably fall into that. But talking to people is really key to figuring out where to go and what to do. Um, I think if we take a step back here, one of the things which I've been recommending to people for many years, mm -hmm. and, and it seems very obvious, but I have to say very few people do it, is to take a sort of 360 degree view of your customers. So if you're creating a journey map, for example, which we've talked about this morning a number of times, um, yes, you can do that with data and that, that can certainly inform it. Um, and you can talk to your employees and they will give you some kind of input. But what you really, really need to do is to talk to your customers. Um, and yes, surveys are good. They're a great start. But do talk to people, actually get their input. And the reason I say this is that in, in a number of instances I've worked on personally, um, we've had situations where, and I'll give you a real world example here. There was a company I worked with who was really quite successful. Um, they were set up to move forward spectacularly, I think, with some new investment and everything was going swimmingly well. They were absolutely convinced that their customers loved them. Um, actually, their customers did love them um, because they had the best product slash service in the market. We undertook a 360 degree sort of, you know, um, analysis. We talked to the employees of this company and we got a good understanding of why their product was so good and so better than everybody else's. And then we talked to some of their customers. And here's the thing, not a single customer said that this company had the best product, had the best service. They didn't say that. And where the company was absolutely convinced that they were winning against their competitors, it turned out that hardly any of their customers had even heard of their competitors. The reason people kept 
going back to this company was because of their customer service. Their customer service was outstanding. They loved this company. It was so easy to deal with. Yes, they had apps. Yes, you could go online. Yes, you could do this. But whatever, they had it nailed. When they took a call, they handled it brilliantly. And an interesting thing, they were really good at admitting when they couldn't do something, when they were wrong. I mean, they were just a very open, honest company. And that was the reason people were going to them. I give that as an example because every company is a bit like that. Even my company. I think people, you know, come to us because we have the best research and, uh, you know, we're, we're whatever. What our customers actually think of us? Well, we have some idea because we have actually bought this talk ourselves. And, you know, I won't go into it. I'm not trying to sell anything here. But the bottom line is it was an eye opener for us as to why people were actually coming to us and why people wanted to use us. And it was very, very informative. And we put that into our marketing. The thing is, um, when it comes to being honest, when it comes to being open, when it comes to being sort of, you know, responsive and uh, analytical about what one is doing in your company today. Very few companies are, are up for that. Um, there was a slide I would have loved to have shown you, um, but I can't, from Forbes, which did, um, just a couple of years ago, did uh, a pretty large survey. And it was asking people how many people, in, you know, how often in your company do you deal with challenges and how well do you deal with challenges when when problems come up in your company how well do you deal with it and the results were absolutely damning um the bottom line is maybe 20 percent, 25 percent of companies actually actively and you know proactively dealt with challenges um most companies like to deny it most companies go into point finger pointing etc so here's the thing, as we move forward into a digital marketing world, and you know, I say move forward because not everybody has got this figured out. And I think that's an important thing to take away from this conference and from everything that's going on in the world is, if you think all of your competitors have got this figured, they haven't, it's not true. Um, you can look at any company in the world, um, you know, my work and, and I think the people on, on the, the conference today who've been speaking typically deal with larger organizations. They're supposed to be the benchmark. They're supposed to be the people who are setting, um, you know, the, the mark for us all to, to reach. Um, they've got it all figured out. They know what they're doing. They analyze their customer data. Not true. Not true at all. I think they're all trying but that's a different thing. I mean, if we take one thing just as an example from the technology standpoint, just about everybody has a CRM system today. Now that can be as basic as some kind of repository where you put your uh, customers' names, addresses, email addresses, et cetera. And of course it can be much more sophisticated than that. You can have a lot of interesting information about uh, your customers' transactions and their likes and their dislikes and uh, you know, what they're actually doing and how they interact with you. But regardless of how sophisticated it is or not, um, that is very, very rich data. That should be informing and working with your digital marketing efforts. Even in the largest organizations, that's actually seldom the case. In most large organizations, there's a serious disconnect. And if we take a step back and out into the, the broader world, if you like, and I'll just give a, this as an example because it's very relevant today. Um, if we take the world of oil and gas, for example, you know, tons of money, very, very important to the world's economy. You'd think they would have a lot of this figured out. They don't. And they can't predict demand. Um, they can't tie that to production, which is key to what we're, we're all doing, whether that's in the hospitality industry, whether it's in the healthcare industry. You know, we want to have some kind of predictive insight as to what's coming so that we can adjust our business to adapt. Um, they don't, they can't, they can't do it. Um, now, is the data there? Sure. Um, can they actually leverage it and make use of it? No. And that's most of us, right? We have the answer somewhere. And to go back to what Cash App was uh, talking about earlier and our very first speaker, um, Jim, um, saying very, very eloquently, you know, we've got to start using data much, much better than we have in the past. Um, AI, machine learning, automation are all coming in, uh, even at the smallest level. 
And that's something I want to stress. Even if you're a 10 person organization versus being a 10,000 or 100,000 person, person organization, the technology is available there for you today. It's very low cost technology. Anybody can have a CRM system, an email marketing system, some kind of campaign system if you like. Anybody can do social media. Um, those things are there for you. Anybody can have them. But anybody can do them badly too. So whether you want to really invest your money heavily um, and you know go all out or whether you want to do it on a, on a very, very, very tight budget, the principles are going to be the same. What you can't do is separate your customer experience into a digital and into a non-digital world. That's got to be tied together. And I think this is where the big challenges come up. If we take that a step further, we have a big challenge within organizations. Again, whether this is a small organization or whether it's a large one. What we have is the fact that people are motivated by different things, right? People are motivated by different things. Um, whether you are um, a CMO, um, whether you are um, somebody who's actually in the call center, um, whoever you are in an organization, you have different, um, different perspectives, different requirements. So how do you actually set CX customer experience priorities, yeah? And I think this is just sort of the practical stuff I want to share with you because again, I don't care how small you are as a company, how big you are as a company, these principles are the same for everybody, right? You know, so there's, there's basic things here. You know, yes, a website, yes, multi-channel, right? Now, multi-channel sounds very impressive, but at the end of the day, typically we're talking email, text, social chat, mobile, etc. right? Now, you may leverage some of those, you may leverage all of those. CRM, whether it's a very simple system or whether it's a complex one, everybody needs that, right? And that needs to be augmented and really cared for. Most people don't augment it. Most people don't care for it very well. So you need to really um, treat customer data very, very importantly and, uh, and invest in that as best you can. But you also need to tie that back to your organization. What are their goals? What are their strategies? What are you really trying to achieve here? So start first with sort of a voice of the customer. Yeah. So yes, uh, customer journeys, very, very important. Um, you know, that's a session for another day, really, uh, how to map those. But voice of the customer. Think about that. Is it you telling them what they want? Is it them telling you what they want, right? So you need to be thinking about the voice of the customer and how to, yes, make them happy, but B, how to not annoy them. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail in a second. So always give very high pr priority to customer data and to analyze that. And again, analytics can be uh, at any range of the, the budget spectrum from you know very advanced uh, machine learning to frankly doing it manually. The one thing that a lot of people really don't take into account is um, processes. Um, this was sort of the mantra of uh, 20 years ago. We had to um, analyze and map uh, business processes and tasks and everybody knew how to, every business person at least, knew how to draw up a flow chart and to make sense of it and say, ah, oh, this is how business works. Of course, it wasn't actually how their businesses worked. It was how they wanted them to work um, because we know that uh, there's many workarounds and realities. Human beings aren't binary. Um, they don't say yes or no. They say, yeah, I think so. Um, so again, you know, we need to start understanding our business uh, processes, but not to nail it down, not to nail down every activity in a perfect way because that, that's frankly not going to happen. What you need to understand is what are the regular tasks? What are the repeatable tasks? What happens the same way pretty much every single time? Those are the areas where you can apply some automation. And again, an automation can be a simple little set of rules or macro if you want to use that term, or it can be complex um, business process management, uh, you know, a again, AI, machine learning, uh, intelligent process management, et cetera. But those are the ones you focus on, right? You know, the things which are gonna happen the same way every time. Never try and get beyond that because you never will, right? Um, it's a corny phrase, but you know, computers at the end of the day, 
even machine learning, which is incredibly adaptable, which is incredibly powerful. Um, still at the end of the day, they are binary. They're zeros and ones, yes and no, black and white. And people are not like that. And they're never going to be like that, right? So automate the things which happen the same way every time and really put your, your efforts into managing the exceptions, right? They're the ones that are gonna hit you as you move forward. So, you know, focus on getting that together in your organization and sort of your organizational readiness. And there was a great example from Present just, just previously um, on his experience with an insurance company. And in one of my slides, which I'd love you to see, but of course you can't for some reason, um, I had an example, which uh, again, it's a real world thing and uh, I, it's from healthcare actually. But again, these, these, this kind of example I'm gonna give you here is uh, pretty common across any industry. Now healthcare in the US is not like healthcare elsewhere. Um, I'm based in Boston, I've lived in the US nearly 20 years, but you may be able to tell from my accent that I'm originally from Britain. And uh, you know, whereas we see that as a public service as most places do, here it's business and very, very big business at that. Um, you know, if we they take an example in healthcare, and this is a uh, this was a real world example. This, this company had really put a lot of money into building a wonderful website, an absolutely fantastic mobile app. I mean, honestly, um, this this nailed it. This is this is award winning what they did. However, didn't work and doesn't work. Okay, because what they have is an incredible digital experience. I won't name the companies they've worked with, but think of the biggest digital marketing companies. And in fact, one of the big, biggest digital marketing companies actually uses this as one of their case studies. Apparently it's wonderful. And it is until you actually use it. And it is until something actually goes wrong. And here's the thing, do you know what goes wrong? Paperwork. The app works great the website works great and it says, yeah, you need to fill in this thing and send it off to us. And that all works perfectly. But what's happening at the back end? The paperwork gets stuck in the same old routines it's always been stuck in. And what's interesting here is the frustration you would have had with a manual process of the past. So let's roll the clocks back 10 years. Um, you want to have some procedure or whatever, you fill in some forms in the US and your insurance company approves it and et cetera, et cetera. You knew there were people dealing with paperwork and you sort of had patience for it. Frustration up to a point, but you were relatively cognizant that there was a miserable person having to deal with your paperwork. So you gave it a week or two. What they did is they built such an amazing web experience that nobody had any patience. They wanted it to happen instantly, absolutely instantly. Hey, I filled this in, where's my result? Why, 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 why can't I move forward? This is this kind of situation which is actually repeated in a lot of digital marketing situations where the digital marketing has gone out there, it's done an amazing job. However, the organization as a whole has not actually embraced everything. It's set now false expectations. We've gone from customers who are very patient, um, excuse the pun in healthcare, but customers who are very patient and actually put up with things, people who were happy to give a call and they say, oh yeah, we're working on it, it will get you to in the next couple of days. People who are perfectly accepting of that situation to a bunch of customers now who are not accepting of it at all. So be very careful. It's great to spend a fortune on digital marketing. You can bring in the best people in the world. You can get your message out there, but be careful of the expectations you're setting. Everybody doesn't need to be delighted. Everybody needs to be satisfied, and there's a big difference. And if you go from 5 to 10% of people who are unhappy with you to 20%, that is going to have a massive impact, not an extra 10% impact. That's going to have tenfold, right? You can finish your company that way pretty quickly, or you can seriously damage it at the very, very least. So again, um, you know, start your CX initiatives by first understanding your customers and your own organization, but never ever shy away from the good, the bad, and the ugly, and make sure you've got a human element tied into it.
And with that, I'll leave a few minutes and wrap up. And I apologize for the problem with the slides. I, everything's clicking on this end, but it's clearly not coming through on yours. Thank you, Alan, for this wonderful uh, points that you've raised. Very enlightening and great listening to you. We do have uh, a lot of questions, but in the interest of time, uh, maybe we will take them offline with you. We'll send it to you. I just want to remind uh, our viewers that tomorrow, uh, the day three of the series would be, uh, the theme for the day three is uh, less talk customer experience. I think that's what people want to, now they're obsessed with. They want to understand what's happening in the customer experience space. So tomorrow is day three. And Alan, if you get time, do join us. We will uh, be glad if you could be there uh, listening to our conversations. And uh, so with this, we come to an end of uh, day two of the series, uh, which is a precursor of the big event that would happen in September. Hopefully, we'll find the vaccine by then. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It has been wonderful. It has been a wonderful session. And thank you, Aaron, once again. See you tomorrow, all of you. Thanks again. Thank you.